All right, let's pick up where we left off, chapter 10, antimicrobial treatment. So what is the goal of antimicrobial drugs? What, ultimately, what do we want them to do? And you say, well, we want them to get rid of the infection. True, how are we gonna do that? Well, first thing uh, that they may want to do is disrupt cell processes or cell structures uh, of the invading microbe, the bacteria, the fungus, or the protozoan. Uh, stops the cell from functioning properly, uh, maybe disrupts set certain cell structures, and we'll talk about all of those uh, as we move along. Uh, it wants to, we want it to inhibit virus replication. Uh, big, uh, again, unless you've been living up a tree or under a rock in the last two years, uh, we know about virus replication. <clears throat> we want these drugs, or these drugs may interfere with the function of certain enzymes. Uh, required for those cells to uh, synthesize or assemble their macromolecules that they need. <clears throat> uh, it needs to destroy structures already formed in the cell. Uh, and uh, it needs to kill or inhibit the microbial cells without damaging the host tissue. That is a process called selective toxicity. <clears throat> and we all know that the perfect agent would have ultimate selective toxicity. It would kill the microbial cells and not damage the host. We know <clears throat> that there is always going to be, with the drugs we have today, uh, some disruption of the host. I won't necessarily call it damage, but there is always some disruption in the host organism whenever we use these antimicrobial drugs. Uh, drugs that have excellent selective toxicity block the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall, such as the penicillins. <clears throat> the reason cell wall drugs are so very uh, effective against things, against uh, invaders for humans, is because humans do not have a cell wall. Since we do not have peptidoglycan, we are unaffected by this particular drug. There are no human cellular interactions with these types of drugs. Now, <clears throat> that does not mean that these drugs do not cause some sort of, again, issue with humans, because they do. Because human beings have colonies of bacteria living on and in our body that are beneficial to us. And those may be affected by the penicillins. But our cells are not disrupted by penicillin. <clears throat> Drugs that are the most toxic to humans, uh, those are the ones that act upon structures common to both the infective agent and the host cell, such as the cytoplasmic membrane. If you take a membrane disruptor to, for your uh, antimicrobial, it is also going to have some effect on your cells as well. Uh, as the characteristics of the infective agent are more and more similar to the host cell, selective toxicity becomes more and more difficult to achieve. So the more alike cells are, the lower the level of selective toxicity that there is. The goals of chemotherapy are to disrupt the structure or function of the organism to a point where it can no longer survive. <clears throat> there are basically five categories of antimicrobials. Uh, we refer to these categories as modes, M-O-D-E-S, modes of action. Uh, the number one, the ones always listed first, are cell wall inhibitors. These things inhibit the cell wall synthesis. They keep the cell from making new cell walls. No new cell walls, no new cells. Uh, you can also have one that inhibits in the nucleic acid, either the RNA or DNA. And these can inhibit either structure and or function. Some of them do one or the other, some of them do both. 
Uh, you may inhibit the ribosome in protein synthesis. We generally call these protein synthesis inhibitors, but they do it by manipulating the ribosome. Uh, things that interfere with the cytoplasmic membrane structure or function. And finally, those ones that inhibit something called folic acid synthesis. That is, again, synthesis is the creation of folic acid. Those are five modes of activity for antimicrobial drugs. Uh, there are, there is a uh, drawing of a typical bacteria that is a, uh, a bacillus shaped bacteria that is flagellated and ciliated. Uh, it looks like, let me see, I'm trying to see, it's got an outer membrane, I believe. So therefore it is a gram negative organism. But you can see all of the places that different drugs uh, can be affected. Here's the protein synthesis inhibitors acting on the ribosomes in different ways. Folic acid synthesis uh, in the cytoplasm blocks the pathways. Here's my cell wall inhibitors, cytoplasmic membrane inhibitors, and DNA and RNA inhibitors. Uh, different drugs target the cell wall. Again, I am not going to ask you to remember all of these different ones, uh, but uh, these are the penicillins. These are the penicillin family. So you see ampicillin, amoxicillin, cloxicillin, penicillin. Uh, these are the cephalosporins. Uh, cephalozolin, cephalopor, cephalexin. Uh, the, the, uh, this is a word I can never say correctly. Carbapenems. And some other miscellaneous drugs that you may have heard of. Ionized it is. Isoniazide, another word I have a hard time saying. Uh, bacitracin, vancomycin. All of these are cell wall inhibitors. Protein synthesis inhibitors, uh, streptomycin, uh, the tetracycline group, uh, some, uh, erythromycin, azithromycin, all of those uh, are uh, members of the group that uh, inf or effect protein synthesis. Folic acids, the sulfa drug, sulfamethazole, silver sulfonamide, trypanotropin. Uh, the sulfenamides are these uh, drugs. Ciproflaxin, oxaflaxin, uh, rifampin. These are drugs that target DNA and RNA. Rifampin is actually an interesting little drug. Uh, human beings, uh, especially light complected human beings, uh, taking this, a large course of this for an extended period of time. Uh, can develop a condition called red man syndrome, where they basically look sunburned uh, for you know all the time. Again, and it's just an interaction for the drug. Uh, cytoplasmic membrane, so the polymyxin group, polymyxin B, uh, daptomycin, uh, so the polymyxin group uh, are the ones that are uh, disruptors of the cell membrane. Uh, broad spectrum versus narrow spectrum activity. Uh, a broad spectrum organism or a broad spectrum drug is effective against more than one group of bacteria. Uh, the example we use here is the tetracycline group. Uh, narrow spectrum uh, is polymyxin again. Uh, that's the way uh, polymyxin is prescribed as a broad spectrum. Uh, a lot of the times you go to uh, the dentist, for instance, uh, if you have to take uh, some, some people with certain heart conditions have, before they have dental work done, before they have a tooth extracted or uh, a root canal or something, they have to take uh, prophylaxis uh, antibiotics and many times polymyxin is the one that they are given. Uh, original penicillin was a narrow spectrum and susceptible to microbial counterattacks. Uh, the molecule uh, can be altered and improved, was uh, altered and improved over the years. Uh, later penicillins have overcome the limitations of the original molecule. And if you'll look back here, you see it, whoops, it says penicillin G and penicillin B. So there are various forms of penicillin and then all of these other penicillin groups that have been developed. 
the later penicillin, oh yes, I said that. Uh, so here are some bacteria, that the disease that they cause, and the spectrum of activity of various antibiotics. And when it asks, are there normal microbiota in this group? Uh, what that's asking is, are there normal microbes that are on your body that may be beneficial to your body in the same group of bacteria as this? And the answer is yes. There are mycobacteria that are on the surface of our bodies. Gram-negative bacteria. Uh, are there gram-negative bacteria on, in our normal microbiota? Yes, there are. Uh, these are the antibiotics given against gram-negatives. Uh, gram-positive. Uh, here, here are, again, those things given against gram-positive. Uh, plague, gonorrhea, salmonella, gram-negative. Strep throat, staph infections, gram-positive. Uh, chlamydias causes chlamydia. Uh, again, penicillins and tetracyclin. Are there normal microbiota in this group? group? Probably. Uh, Rickettsia that causes a disease called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It's transmitted by a tick bite. Uh, the antibiotic for this is tetracycline. And we don't know whether there are any human microbiota uh, that are found in the same group as Rickettsias. As far as we know, there are not. But again, we have still yet to uh, uh, identify the normal biota for every human being because every human being's normal biota will vary slightly. Uh, we talked earlier in the semester about biofilms. Uh, biofilms behave differently uh, than when these bio, when these particular bacteria are living, uh, free living. Uh, many times they are unaffected by the same antimicrobials anti that work against them. Uh, antibiotics uh, often cannot penetrate the sticky extracellular material surrounding biofilms. Uh, it's one of the issues, again, with our teeth. Uh, and the bacteria in biofilms express a different phenotype and have different antibiotics and susceptibility profiles than free-living bacteria. So treating biofilm infections, and again, most of the time places you're going to see these are in your mouth. Uh, that is uh, sometimes a difficult thing to do. Uh, the biofilm treatment suggests that we need to interrupt the quorum sensing the pathways. In other words, interrupt the most sensing pathways. Uh, daptomycin has shown some success. Uh, adding a DNA ACE to antibiotics aids their penetration through extracellular debris. Uh, impregnating devices with antibiotics prior to insertion will prevent colonization. And some antibiotics actually cause biofilm to form at a higher rate than they normally would. So again, anytime you're under antibiotics, you should be under a physician's care. Uh, fungal cells are eukaryotic, and they're going to present special problems in drug treatment. Uh, drugs designed to act on bacteria are ineffective against funguses. Uh, the similarities between fungal cells and human cells means that drugs toxic to fungi are going to harm human tissue. Uh, and there are only a few agents with special antifungal poly, uh, properties have been developed. The thing about antifungal drugs is, number one, they usually have to be taken for a very long time. Instead of days, you're dealing with weeks. And they are usually fairly pricey. Uh, and here are some uh, different antifungal drugs and the things they are effective against. Uh, you probably have never heard of any of these unless you have actually had to take on or know somebody who has. Uh, Anti-malarial drugs. Uh, the principal treatment for malaria for hundreds of years was something called quinine. Uh, it has been replaced by less toxic uh, synthesized quinolones uh, like chloroquine and primaquine. Uh, several species of plasmodium parasites uh, in many stages of its life cycle mean that no single drug is universally effective. 
Uh, the staple drug is uh, artemisinin, which is the newest drug. But again, uh, as is often the case, this drug is relatively expensive. Quinine is still relatively expensive. So in lots of areas of the world, people are still being treated for malaria with quinine. Uh, Antiprotozoal drugs, metronidazole is widely used as an amoebicide, uh, treats intestinal infections and hepatic, hepatic, hepatic diseases caused by Entamoeba histolytica, which is an amoeba species. Uh, also can be used to treat Guardiolambia, which is causes a condition called Giardia, and Trichomonas vaginalis, which causes a condition called Trichomonas. Uh, these all treatments, the one side effect in something like 10 to 15 percent of patients that take, that take metronidazole is a condition called black hairy tongue. Uh, it causes the papillae on the tongue to turn black and it causes them to swell. So people that have taken this, that have this reaction, uh, again, their tongue looks like it's hairy and black. Uh, this is a very commonly given uh, antimicrobial after certain types of surgery. Uh, my wife has had two brain surgeries, and both times after her brain surgery, she was given metronidazole as a prophylactic to ensure that she did not get any kind of protozoal disease into her brain. Uh, other drugs that have antiprotozoal activities, uh, quinacrine, uh, the sulfonamides, and tetracycline. So again, uh, these, are, these two are antibiotics, but they do show some level of success against certain protozoans. Uh, the challenges of anti-helminthic drug therapy and helminths, again, are worms. Uh, so you've got flukes, which are flatworms, you've got tapeworms, which are flatworms, and you've got roundworms. Uh, these are large parasites. Uh, they have a physiology that's much more similar to us. Therefore, the agents used to treat them uh, is many times going to also do harm to the host. Uh, the best way to treat these is by blocking reproduction. Uh, but again, that doesn't usually affect the adult worms. Uh, and most of the affected drugs immobilize, disintegrate, or inhibit the metabolism of all stages of the drug cycle. However, what this can cause, especially this, it can cause, these can cause issues in the liver and the kidneys. So uh, there are challenges if you get a uh, helmet, helmet infection. Now, tapeworms, which are usually in the uh, intestine, uh, are probably the easier ones to cure. Some of these roundworms and flukes actually travel through the bloodstream and attack themselves to the outside of the liver, so it's really hard to get to them to do for the drugs to have any effect. Uh, the agents used to treat helminthic diseases, uh, albendazole inhibits microtubules of worms, eggs, and larvae from forming, uh, pyrantal Paralysis, or paralysis paralyzes, I'll get the word right in a minute, the muscles of intestinal roundworm. Uh, Prosequinel is for tapeworm and fluke infections. And ivermectin, uh, which has been in the news a lot lately, uh, is used for strong leodiasis and onchorosis in humans. Uh, that was the the big deal with COVID and people want to use ivermectin and they were saying that, you know, the, the one group of people were saying, well, that's a horse, uh, that's a horse pace. That's what you give you. That's what you use to deworm your horses. You can also see it is used in human beings as well. Was it an effective treatment against uh, COVID-19? I'm not a doctor. I don't play a doctor on television. I'm not going to say. But it was disingenuous of people to mock the people who were taking it, saying they were taking a horse medication when it was absolutely a medicine that has been approved 
by the FDA for use in humans. Now, not for use for treating COVID-19, but it is an acceptable use. It has an acceptable use in humans. Uh, antivirals, uh, treating viruses present some very unique problems. Uh, number one, that agent is going to rely on a host cell for most of its metabolic function. Uh, to disrupt those metabolic functions requires disrupting the cellular metabolism of the host. Uh, in most cases, treatment of a virus is best done by preventing the virus. Measles, mumps, and hepatitis are all prevented through the use of vaccines. So when it comes to virus, it is better to never get it, which is actually true of everything, but viruses specifically, it is better to prevent it than try to treat it. Things like AIDS, influenza, and the common cold attest to the need of more effective medications for the treatment of viral pathogens. Uh, what is the treatment for the common cold? Get plenty of rest, drink plenty of fluids, and a week or 10 days it should be gone. Uh, influenza, best, best thing, get the shot. Uh, AIDS, uh, again, AIDS is a disease that is much different now than it was 40 years ago. 40 years ago, it was a death sentence. Today, uh, people are living long, reasonably healthy, happy lives uh, with AIDS. But once it's there, this is a disease that at, with, the current, with our current technology, you don't ever get rid of. It's there. Uh, how do antivirals work? Number one is they can inhibit the virus actually entering the cell. Uh, they can do that in a number of ways by disrupting the receptors, disrupting the fusion process, uh, preventing the uncoating of the bacteria, all of those, or excuse me, the virus, uh, all of those things. Uh, you can inhibit the nucleic acid synthesis. Acyclovir is probably the most common one we have. Uh, the other cyclovirs, darabin, uh, ribarabin, all of those. Again, I'm not going to ask you to remember all these different antivirals. Uh, or they can inhibit the viral assembly or release, uh, such as uh, indenavir, sequinavir, and sanamavir. All right, I want to stop it there. I will wrap this chapter up uh, after a while. Y'all have a great rest of your day, uh, and don't get too hot. Mm. Mama. Oh.